For those of us who might not have the privilege of being able to access the knowledge of our grandparents and ancestors, um, it might be helpful to have access to another set of superpowers, the superpowers that we get from data. And so our next speaker is the, uh, the World Data Lab CEO, Wolfgang Fengler, who's going to zoom in to illustrate the trends in data touching migration cities and climate change. Welcome, Wolfgang. Thank you so much, Saya. Welcome, everybody. We at World Data Lab try to count everything and everyone, including all of you. And if you count everyone, you make everyone count. And let's start with making it count and responding to three of the big questions that we have, all of you, in life. The first is, how long will I live? And there is actually, you may be surprised, there's a mathematical answer to this. And we built this tool, and, and I hope really you want to enjoy and play with numbers and enjoy math. So one way to think about it is just to check out, we know, you know this, how old you are, which country you are from, and uh, which gender you are. And we do this exercise with the prominent guest today, one of the most prominent of many, Trevor Noah. He's born, he has a big birthday, by the way, coming up, 20th February, 1984. Be ready, next, uh, Trevor, next February. In South Africa, he would live till August 14, 2054. I think that's a Thursday, but in the US, only 31 years <laughs> left. In, he moved to the US, Trevor. He gained 13 years, just in moving to the US. One of the inequities in the world, Depends where you live, it shows you how long you live. In chat, and you just heard the wonderful presentation, it would only be 29 years, one of the few countries where Trevor would live shorter than in South Africa. What's the best country for Trevor? Any guess? It's the birthplace of his father, Switzerland. So not Japan, Switzerland. 48 years left to live. Remember? Chad was 29. 20 years life expectancy gap for somebody like Trevor Noah and most of you. How can we put this differently? What's the challenge, the inclusion, the inequality challenge? It depends where you live is when you die. How many people will die this year? The number is 68 million. 68 million will die this year, and too many die young. Now, I use a very generous definition of young, which includes me too now, that is actually <laughs> 28 million, so 65 years is the threshold. So many of you will be in the lower half here, but 28 million of us who are still young die this year. 40 million die old. We eventually will die, but if we die, we should die old, and that should be one of the objectives of this forum and of the World Bank and the IMF, try to get this 28 million number down to zero. Where do these people die? They die. Most, as you can expect, die in Asia, because Asia has most of the people in the world. And so in Asia now, 23 million die old, 14 million die young. So Asia has half of the young death uh, in the world. How is America? So I combined them similar to Asia. More old people die, but still 4 million young die in North and South America. What about Europe? 7.5 million die old this year, only 1 million die young. So Europe looks good. So what's left? Left is the continent where Chad is. One, two and a half million Africans die old. Nine million Africans die young. So for every African that dies old this year, almost four Africans die young. That's one of the big inequalities of the world. Still today, even though these numbers have gotten better, but they're still not good. Second big question, how much money will we earn? Or put differently, how much have actually normal people to spend? How much do people spend every day? And as you know, there is this global definitions. Two dollars roughly is extreme poverty. Then you have twelve dollars. That's the, actually the beginning of the middle class when people start to consume and they start to live a normal modern life. And then you have you know, many of us who are more in the wealthy segment. So what do the numbers tell us? 600 million still live in extreme poverty. 3.4 billion are vulnerable. Still the US or European definition of poor to some extent. 3.75 billion, a large group middle class, and then 250 million upper class or rich. So let's add these numbers together. What's that? Three, 600 million plus 3.4, how much is that? That's actually 4 billion. And 375, 250, also 4 billion. So you guys, we all live in this historic moment, 8 billion people in the world, and it's half-half. 4 billion, poor, vulnerable, 4 billion, middle class and wealthy the best moment we ever had in terms of consumption and spending and income in the world, but still half on the left side. 
what will the next decade bring? What will the future bring? Here's a positive news. Unlike what you may think from the US debate and the European debate, the middle class is rising. It is rising super fast, four people per second. And it's mostly an Asian phenomenon. So if you guys, which you should check out, live long enough, which is just 10 years more, we and you will experience middle class dominance in the world. There will be 5 billion middle class consumers in, the next, in 10 years from now. This decade is Asia's. Next decade will start to be Africa's. Now, you may be skeptical a bit because if you have so many more people and they consume more, can we sustain the planet? Third big question, can we still prosper and manage climate change? So I'll share the last set of data for you here now. Uh, we built also this world emissions clock. We just presented it at the World Bank spring meetings. Uh, the numbers uh, of emissions that we are producing is large. It's actually, the clock is ticking. Every second, we add 2,000 tons. And these 2,000 tons will add up for the whole year to 58 gigatons. Really big number to absorb. 100,000 tons per minute, by the way. So these 58 gigatons, 2,000 tons per second, come from different countries and different sectors. As you can see here, US, India, and China will show up quite a lot in this emissions clock. So what's interesting, though, and what must surprise you is the numbers are quite different across countries, especially if you think you as an individual and your friends in Chad, your friends in South Africa. And uh, let's run through the numbers. Um, the US is not the worst emitting among the G20 per capita, which is the country with the mo highest per capita emissions in the world, um, highest per capita emissions in the G20, is actually Saudi Arabia. So from 7.4 tons, which we all emitting if you were world citizens, average world citizens, that's the number. So 58 billion uh, tons divided by 8 billion people, that's 7.4 tons per capita. Saudi Arabia, 26 tons almost four times more than the average world citizen. But obviously it's an average across the big world, from Chad to China to Saudi Arabia to the US. Where's the US? Any guess which number is the US in the G20? It's actually only fourth place. Number two is Canada. So sorry, MasterCard friends from Canada. And, uh, and number three is Australia. Number four is the US. US has 19 and 18.4 tons. A lot of energy in there, a lot of transport. Um, obviously still number two in total emissions after China, because a lot of people times 18 tons is a lot of emissions. It's US. Where is, I'm from Europe. Where's Europe? Where's the EU? The EU is surprisingly low, you may wonder, only 8.2 tons. So Europe has roughly half of an American. Um, so it's still my wonder, okay, these are all bad numbers. They're all more than the average. The air is getting warmer, even in this room. The world is getting hotter. Climate change is accelerating. Where is there hope? Is there any hope? And here's another last data exercise I'll do with you, which is let's check these five key sectors. These are all sectors, by the way, that cause the emissions. And uh, check the best countries. Check the best rich countries, because people should be rich and live in clean air and a and a good climate. So these are the countries. Dutch transport, UK industry, whatever is left there, uh, Swiss um, energy, which is really low. <laughs> um, uh, Swedish buildings, hardly any emission. I don't know any Swede here. You guys have these amazing buildings. It seems in South Korea has this amazing um, reforestation program that actually has negative emission now. So in the end, you get this low number, 3.1 tons. And these are good countries to live in, 3.1 tons in these good countries. And let's check what these countries uh, would look like if they keep their promises. And they're doing quite OK in those sectors. So that's then 2.2 tons, really low number. Remember where Saudi Arabia was at the beginning, the US, 19 tons? 2.2 tons in this combination. How much does this compare? How does this compare with the Paris Agreement target for 2030? This is 2030 number. 3.6 tons. So if the, all the world did everything they could, to reduce climate change. There'll be 3.6 tons by 2030. And if you just take those five countries' best sectors, we are 2.2 tons. So this lets me conclude to tell you we should not choose between consumption and climate. We need to be more ambitious. We should, to create a safe, a clean, a safe, clean planet with prosperity, with prosperity for all. 
That needs to be um, our ambition, the ambition for all of you, for MasterCard, and for us in general in the development community. Thank you very much.